Dude, we got the house, they hit it to the pond, ready to fish. <laughs> Best friends, but over the day, I love this fish, it's all that dog. But no, it's a good question. Did they catch anything? Did they catch anything? Did. Uh, good morning. Let me get us started, but yes, and you all want to lead a word of prayer, too. Good evening, good evening. I take it, trust one online, Charles? We are. Okay. Uh, welcome to the Highway 30 Church of Christ Bible Study, Wednesday, July the 27th. All right. I always get confused on the day sometimes, but anyway, it's July 27th. It's good to have you out if you're online. Thank you for tuning in. Got a small crowd tonight. Anybody know where Betty and Eddie are? Betty and Eddie are on the premises. Um, what kind of announcements do we need to No what? No, 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 no. Well, yeah, that's an excellent news. No. Brady went to the neurologist, so he said. He's been having light-headed like, dizziness and everything. It just contributes to diet and lack of salt, maybe low blood pressure at times. He's been having some minor problems, but doesn't seem to be any lasting problem. I finally got clearance from my cardiologist so now I can take the next step forward but I don't have a date that just happened yesterday so I have not heard from the vascular surgeon but now we can proceed with that so next step will be to set a date. Eddie! Hello everybody. How was your night in Atlanta airport? <laughs> did you have to spend that? I was actually just throwing that out there. Is that where you spent the night? I did. Eddie's back from the Great West with his tales of adventure from Atlanta Airport. Everybody ever do that at least once. <laughs> yeah. So have I, yeah. It, uh, yeah, bad time of, of uh, life to have a job that requires constant travel. I got a couple of friends like that. Um, but anyways, it's good to have you back, Eddie. I'm glad. That is the worst trouble you ran into. What was that joke? Remember Sully that landed the airplane on the Hudson? I can't recommend too many stand-up comics because of, you know, how stand-up comics are. Um, but one I can recommend fairly uh, confidently is Brian Regan, for any of you that have ever heard of him. He's really clean, but... He tells a good Sully joke about landing the airplane on the Hudson. He said, you ever notice in America that you're a hero, but when they ask if you're a hero, you got to say no, and then everybody's good? He said, you know, sometimes, can't, isn't it just obvious, can't you just go ahead and say yes? And, Sully, are you a hero? Ah, uh, did you see that plane? Nose up, tail down, balance perfectly. Of course I'm a hero, you should give me a cape. But uh, yeah, it's pretty funny. And there was another joke that connected to that that Eddie reminded me of. Oh yeah, he, uh, he said I was watching the newscast after Sully landed the plane and he said, uh, newscaster said, I can't imagine a better ending to this story. And Brian Regan said, how about landing in Charlotte with dry socks? <laughs> yeah, but what, a, what an incredible moment. Um, but anyways, airlines travel is uh, very difficult. Um, <clears throat> don't seem to have an answer to it, but we are glad to have you home, Eddie. Thank you, sir. 
Uh, Michael is not here tonight. We hope all is well, Michael. Uh, and in lieu of that, Stanley has volunteered to lead us in a song and a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Oh, one last announcement. Um, uh, I won't be here next Wednesday. Warner Robins got me on their summer series next Wednesday night, and Charles will fill in. He'll get the he gets two pretty good chapters out of the book of Genesis next week. Love is in the air when Jacob meets Rachel, but that'll be next week. But, uh, we will uh, have, let Charles uh, have that class next week. But anyways, go ahead. Number 500, number 589, 589, leaning on the everlasting arms. Genesis 28. Charles, you got your family in town, I understand. What's up?
Yeah, that's right. I said chapter 28. We didn't quite knock out uh, 27 last week. We finished at verse 41. Of course, Jacob has just, with his mother's help, stolen his brother's birthright. And Esau is pretty upset with that. So Esau hated, verse 41, chapter 27. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Now again, as I mentioned last week, one of the interesting features of this is Isaac performs this blessing uh, because he's old and firm to ask Esau to go out and <clears throat> kill some savory game so he could eat it and bless him before he dies. But in fact, Isaac will live another 38 years. Um, and yet, you know, he's blinded. That's why he was able to be fooled. Uh, so Isaac obviously gave the appearance that his final days were upon him, but that wasn't the case. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what the explanation is for that, but even Esau seems to be under the impression that it won't be long. But anyways, uh, obviously his brother has stolen a blessing that he did not value at the time, but <clears throat> once he lost it, uh, he started to see its importance, and now he is looking to comfort himself by killing his brother Jacob. And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran. And stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you. And he forgets what you have done to him. And I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? And of course, that's a reference to on the day that Isaac dies, Esau will feel free to avenge his death. And therefore, Rebekah will suffer the death, be a widow, and mourning in mourning for the death of her favorite son as well. Wouldn't Esau have to go to the city of refuge? To... Well, that's the law of Moses. It doesn't come along for 400 years. Oh, okay. Now... <clears throat> We do see, and in, in the next chapter we will see it as well, you, know, you see things that are in the Law of Moses predated, or they predated the Law of Moses, but not everything did. Uh, but that concept, Charles, I think predated it. I just, I, we don't have any really organal or uh, um, um, evidence um, in the sense of documents or anything. Does so everybody know what we're talking about, the city of refuge? The avenger of blood. In the law of Moses, the provision was if you killed somebody accidentally, you flee to one of six cities, cities of refuge. You had to live there. Uh, the judges of the town determined if it was accidental, uh, then you were safe from the avenger of blood as long as you dwelt in that city. The minute you left that city, the avenger of blood could take vengeance on you for killing somebody close to them. We don't really know who the avenger of blood is exactly, but obviously it's a close family member uh, who would take vengeance on you. You had to stay in the city of refuge um, for the rest of your, or actually, um, anybody know when you could leave the city of refuge? When the high priest died. Which seems like a peculiar way to say it's okay, now you can go home. I don't really know what the answer to that is, other than it starts a new era. But you, um, <clears throat> you want to know how wicked, I can't think of the passage off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it's in Hosea. It's been a long time since I taught Hosea. But you want to know how wicked the people of the northern kingdom were. I think Shechem was one of the cities of refuge that people would head to that were in that uh, position. Well, there were robbers positioned outside the city. 
ready to rob anybody that came into town. Why do you think a city of refuge, if you were a robber, would have been a great place to stop? Think about it. Why do you think a city of refuge would have been a great place to stock if you were a robber? I wonder if that's where the tradition that still exists today, I guess, that I know in some places uh, common for people to flee to the church, particularly the Catholic church, to seek refuge there. And I forget, it hasn't been too long ago, about some uh, person that the law was after was... Uh, I vaguely remember that story. I just wondered if that's where that... Uh, oh, that's long been the case. Joab did the same thing. Or... I want to say it was Joab that fleed into the sanctuary, grabbed hold of the horns. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of passages in the Old Testament that speak to that. Um, <clears throat> anyways, just to finish my thought, you know, today's world, things are a little bit different. But if you were leaving town tonight in a world prior to uh, computer age, let's say, what are you going to take with you? Hey, I'm leaving tonight. I'm not coming back. What are you taking with you? Actually, I'm not leaving tonight. I'm going to wait till morning. Because I got somewhere I want to stop before I leave town forever. You know where I'm stopping? The bank. Like I said, it, it doesn't work in today's world because, you know, you take a bank card with you anywhere you go in the United States, but once upon a time, if I'm leaving town, first thing I'm going to do is get my money. If you're leaving town and head to a city of refuge, what do you got on you? All your valuables. Guess who knows that? Robbers. And I'm pretty sure it's in the book of Hosea that he specifically pointed to them and said, this is how evil you are. <laughs> you lay in wait. Outside of Shechem. I think it's Shechem, but don't quote me on that. But, um, but anyways, yeah, a manslayer could kill you unless you uh, dwelt in the city of refuge. You had to stay there either the rest of your life or the rest of the high priest's life. So uh, that is very true. But I don't think that goes back to the... And by the way, what is uh, Esau actually avenging? <laughs> He's not avenging anything other than the fact that he let his brother get the best of him. Um, yes, his brother was very sneaky and deceiving towards him, living up to his name of deceiver or supplanter, but uh, even then <clears throat> he had no right to kill him. But his mother recognizes um, <clears throat> that, uh, that Esau is angry, and it'll be a while before his anger is... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, lessons. Uh, a lot of people think chapter 28 should start between verses 45 and 46. I kind of agree with them, although I don't think it's a major deal. But I think chapter 28 ought to start with verse 46. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like these... <coughs> who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Um, beware of any particular, like if, you'll, if you're a History Channel fan, um, but not just the History Channel, but beware of Bible programs on places like the History Channel and that kind of thing. Beware of any kind of Bible program that is widely distributed to a wide audience. They tend to get the most liberal of scholars that you can get, and particularly when we're talking about the Law of Moses. Anybody ever heard of the documentary hypothesis theory? Didn't start talking. Nobody has. Um, I had to test my students out last semester, which is one of the reasons it's in my mind. Because last semester, when I first started at Warner Robins there, we were teaching uh, um, Exodus, and then after Exodus, I was asked to teach Leviticus numbers and Deuteronomy. So I've been all about the Law of Moses here the last year. But documentary, uh, who wrote the book of or the Law of Moses? You just said the who wrote the Law of Moses? <laughs> Moses. Yeah, it's also known as the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. But particularly on programs like that, you will, they come from the 19th century liberal school that does not believe 
that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. In fact, um, the theory goes so far as to suggest that when Nehemiah was reading the law, uh, I forget the chapter off the top of my head, but Nehemiah's reading of the law was the first time the law of Moses had ever been read in front of a Jewish audience. And that Genesis and the Exodus were actually written during the days, uh, or actually I should say finished during the days of Nehemiah and afterwards. Now Nehemiah didn't come along until, let's just round off, 500 B.C. So Moses claims to have written the first uh, five books about 1400 B.C. The kind of scholarship that shows up on those kind of programs do not believe that Moses wrote it and that none of it was written until after Ezra. In fact, the book of Ezra is the first time the law was read. Here's a trick question for you, and it's not really a trick. But what was the first book written by Moses? Huh? Very good. And the reason why I said it's a trick question is I think most people would just think, well, Genesis, it's first. No, he was writing Exodus. Came down the mountain with the law. That's the book of Exodus. Somewhere in the wilderness he wrote the book of Genesis, obviously, and Genesis rightly appears at the head of the Pentateuch, but yes, he actually, in fact, started with the book of Exodus. But the Pentateuch takes this position. <clears throat> I mean, the documentary hypothesis takes this position. By the way, I'm teaching all this, or talking about all this, because of what we're about to read here. Um, that the law of Moses evolved over centuries and that there were documents that they uh, talk about but no one ever produces and they have <clears throat> different authors that came along and supplemented as they went and the law of Moses was not compiled by one man it was written over centuries by different priests along the way from documents that they imagine existed but don't and what they do is they pick apart everything in the law it's almost as if the worst possible people could got a hold of the Bible and they misread every passage. And every time something doesn't sound right to them, or for instance, every time Elohim is used in one verse and Jehovah is used in the verse behind it, they'll tell you that's two different authors. Almost as if Moses couldn't use both words to describe God. But that's the kind of nonsense they get into. And the theory goes... <coughs> as you read verse 46, that this is two different authors. What we just read up to this point. Yes, Betty? What's the title of that theory again? Documentary Hypothesis Theory. It's the idea that the Law of Moses was written over centuries by various and sundry authors. And according to this theory, whoever wrote up until verse 45 did not write verse 46. See if you can guess why. And Rebecca said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like those who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Now what possible reason do you think they would come up with that whoever wrote verse 45 didn't write verse 46? What's the reason Rebecca gives Jacob that she's sending him away? In verse 45. What's the reason she gives Jacob personally? She's afraid he'll take the wives of the daughters of Heth. No, 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 no. Oh, no. She's afraid he shall kill Oh, yeah, that. But what does she tell Isaac? This is the kind of bizarre nonsense that you get into with some of these people. It's almost like, man, why don't you guys stop talking? You make my ears hurt. Because she told Jacob. Your brother's going to kill you. You need to get out of here. But then she turned around and told Isaac, I'm sending him back to uh, Haran to marry one of the daughters of our people. That since those are two different reasons, they have to be two different authors. And that's the kind of stuff you get into. It's almost like the worst people that could possibly... They read the Bible as though everything is supposed to be distrusted. Meanwhile... Whatever the historical documents they found in the secular world, they read them like they're gospel. 
and it's maddening to listen to uh, and you wonder how it got to be so prominent a theory. It's a ridiculous theory when it's all said and done. And these are the kind of explanations they give as to uh, why they come up with the theory. But anyways, why did he tell, uh, why did Rebecca tell Isaac that he's sending Jacob away for one reason when she told Jacob to go away for another reason? First of all, are they both true? Yeah, absolutely. You stay here. As soon as Isaac dies, Esau's going to kill you. They're different people. Huh? They're different people. Right. And I think she's also emphasizing something that would uh, be more likely to get Isaac to agree with her. Isaac has seen what uh, Esau's marriages to the, uh, the Canaanite women have done. And so she knows that Isaac will get on board with that. Plus... If you bring up the fact that Esau wants to kill Jacob, <clears throat> you ever sometimes not talk about something in your house because you know it's going to start a fight? <laughs> I think I'll just observe the Passover on this one. I'd rather go to bed tonight, a little peace of mind, and start opening up this can of worms. Well, anyways, this has got to be a powder keg in the family. You know, Jacob has, by deception, taken his brother's birthright, but Isaac cannot reverse it even though he would like to up to this point because Esau is his favorite. Because it had a force, I mean, we don't really understand it, but the, the, just by the wording of the... Uh, Being that it was by deception, you think that that would avoid it? Well, it was by deception, but it was God's will that, that it happened. Right, but Isaac wasn't going by God's will, he was going by his own. No, that's what I'm saying is the... And the point I'm trying to make is that there's obviously a force that even though it's not written, that Isaac understood, I can't reverse this. This is the will of God. He's prophesying the future. And Isaac knew that despite my will, I can't reverse this. I, I think it's the same thing as Darius when he signed the petition that uh, Daniel go in the lion's den. He didn't want him to go. But... Yeah, it, that's another good example. Yeah, it had. That was the law in that land yeah. that he couldn't By the way, that's one of the things that, uh, there's a great phrase in Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, God brought forth his son, born of a woman, um, born under the law. What does in the fullness of time mean? Huh? Yeah. What does that phrase mean? In the fullness of time, God brought forth his son. When God decided that time was right. And guess what had to happen before God decided the time was right? The Persian Empire had to sweep across the world because guess what the Persian Empire brought the world that it had not known before the Persian Empire? Respect for the rule of law. Even Darius did not want to put Daniel in the lines then. But he'd signed the decree. And the law is the law. Persians brought a great respect for the law that, that um, uh, was necessary to have that kind of respect for the law throughout the world before the gospel was preached. But anyways, we're getting kind of off the subject there. But anyways, uh, that's the documentary hypothesis theory that postulates that somehow there's two different authors here. Um, um, and I, sorry, I just don't have a, I got a kind of a short fuse for people that read the Bible with such little faith. I mean, you know, you know it's, there's one thing about, you know, are there some profound questions that, you know, science has troubled us with as far as, you know, the age of the universe and that kind of thing? Yeah, there is. But to read the Bible as though it isn't the inspired word of God and we aren't supposed to naturally absorb what is being obviously said to us, especially if it makes sense. I think there's no dilemma here just because um, Rebecca told Jacob one thing or leave town for one reason and then told Isaac Jacob needs to leave town but she gave a different reason. There's, there's no dilemma there. That's just why, you know, I can't totally explain why Rebecca did it that way. But anyways, 
I don't see a dilemma. <clears throat> Look at uh, Romans chapter 9 for a minute. You know, uh, Jacob and Esau brings up another topic that, that um, Romans 9. Look at verse 6. And Sarah, what Sarah just said is what got me thinking about this. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by her father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, of course, predestinationists jump all over this. But where does the passage, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated? He's quoting. What's he quoting? Anybody got a reference to that, where that quote can be found in the Old Testament? Malachi. Malachi. Why is that significant? What book are we in right now? I don't mean Romans. I mean, what book are we trying to study? Genesis. Written in 1400 B.C. When was Malachi written? About 400. A thousand years after Moses. In the book of Malachi, when God said, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated, they had already lived their lives. Like one of the confusing things for some people is they think God arbitrarily chose Jacob and arbitrarily chose to Esau. No, God is all-knowing, which means before the two boys were born, he already knew what kind of character they had. He didn't choose Jacob because he arbitrarily loved Jacob over Esau. He chose Jacob because even though Esau is the firstborn, God who sees the future as well as today, he already knew what kind of child he's looking at. He's dealing with Esau. He's profane. He already knew that Jacob, who is imperfect as we have noticed, but he is a much better choice and is at least uh, <clears throat> respectful and desirous of spiritual gifts. So when, when Malachi comes along and says, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated, he's not saying that beforehand. 
He's saying that after the fact. And Paul is seizing all over Jacob and Esau, letting us know that, yes, God did choose uh, Jacob over Esau, but there are reasons why Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated it for the same reasons that John the Baptist said, God can raise children up of, of Abraham out of these stones. What was John the Baptist pointing? One of the problems with the Jewish mindset is they thought, you know, if I was circumcised on the eighth day, I'm in the covenant and I'm, therefore I'm saved. And yet they were atrocious, wicked people. But they thought they're in the covenant, so I must be saved. And that's why John the Baptist said, no, you've got to repent. God could raise up children of Abraham from these stones. That's not the criteria. It's never been the criteria. There were reasons why God chose Jacob over Esau based on the character of the two children. But anyways. This is chasing a rabbit line. Pretty much what we've been doing tonight, so let's jump in. <laughs> um, a long time since I've had a rabbit. Uh, the economy keeps going the way it's going. Well, I'll be eating rabbit soon. When I, when I go back to the beginning in Genesis, it's like the whole thing about Oh, okay. One of the jokes we used to kick around at school is, you know, of course the knock against the Church of Christ is, oh, you're the people that think you're the only one saved. And uh, I remember one of my instructors saying, I hate when people say that to me because they, I can't say what I'm really thinking. You know what I'm really thinking, don't you? Yeah. Not all of us are saved, are you kidding? If the righteous are scarcely saved, narrow is the way. The one thing I would say, though, to, to put a little more hope in what you just said than that, I got to believe I know. I personally know eight righteous souls. Um, maybe, you know, I'm just in the travels that I've been in. Uh, as, you know, depressed as the times can be sometimes, and they can be depressed, depressing, I still know a whole lot of people that I really believe are sincerely seeking after the Lord. So I don't think the picture is as bleak uh, as we sometimes allow ourselves to believe it is. Maybe I'm wrong, but now, I know a lot of righteous people, and I I'm not well-traveled. I haven't been in that many places. lived in Michigan, Florida, now Georgia, and California for a couple of years. But, um, but I know some, and I, I imagine you do too. But, but anyways, um, but still narrow is the way. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, Okay, anyways, let's get back to the text. 
chapter 28, verse 1. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, uh, your mother's father, and take yourselves a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, and the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. And what's the interesting thing about um, these marriages, according to the book of Exodus? Or I should, yeah, according to the book of Exodus. These are illegal marriages by the time the law of Moses comes along. You can't marry people this close to you um, in the law of Moses. What chapter is that? Huh? Uh, yeah, Exodus is not the only place, but, um, but I had one in particular that jumped out at me. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time looking for it. Actually, I said Exodus. I meant Leviticus. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, um, for instance, in Leviticus 18... Verse uh, 12, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister. She is near of kin to your father. I wrote Exodus 6.20 down next to that. Anybody know what's in Exodus 6.20? I'll read it to you. Now Amram took for himself Jacobin, his father's sister's wife, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And years of the life of Amram were 137. Why did I write Exodus 6.20 next to Leviticus 18.12? Because according to Leviticus 18.12, Moses' own parents was an illegal marriage. Had it been after the law of Moses, but it was before the law of Moses. Here in the book of Genesis, Man in his earlier state before the law of Moses came along, these marriages were okay. Uh, close family members was not what, uh, what it is by the time of the law of Moses and particularly in our day and time. You know, marriages we wouldn't think of entering into, um, but in the days of the patriarchs, they were okay. Again, I think this is one of the reasons why the vapor canopy theory, for lack of a better idea, or better name, I should say, I have some uh, belief in. Why were all the patriarchs before the flood, how old were they living to be? I think it's 810 was the average age of the, of the years you get in the book of Genesis before the flood. What's the first thing that happens when we get genealogies after the flood? Cut in half. Goes down from 810 to somewhere in the 400s. And as you slowly move your way towards the law of Moses, how old did Ab was Abraham when he died? Anybody remember? 175. Isaac, as we've just noticed, he's not dead yet, but Isaac will be 180. Lifespan is, uh, how old was Moses? When he died. Moses is easy if you think about it. 40 years in uh, son of Pharaoh, 40 years in the wilderness, and 40 years leading Israel. He was 120 when he died. You know what's the interesting thing about the age of Moses? Huh? He lived to be 120, but he's the one that wrote the psalm that 70 years a man should expect, and if by reason of strength, 80. There's one of those farther along, we'll know all about it questions. I got a question for you, Moses. 
Why did you write that? In Moses' lifetime, he seems to have understood that man should expect to live about 70 years. And yet he lived to be 120. That's a kind of a dilemma for me as far as, and it's just a curious question I have for Moses. But, uh, but anyways, we notice the ages moving to uh, what we now expect and have been this way for a long time. And they may go up a year or two depending on uh, <clears throat> science and technology, but still, 70, 80 years is what you expect to live. Um, um, who was Cain's wife? Naturally, she had to be either a straight-out sister or a very close relative. Um, she didn't necessarily have to be a sister, but, but it very well could have been her sister. Well, why, why wasn't that a problem? It wasn't a problem because man was so healthy. He was living to be 900 years old, and close interpersonal uh, relations like that would not have uh, aggravated uh, poor genes in the, um, uh, as man began to decline, it, uh, it wouldn't have been a problem then. But as time mar marched on uh, and moved forward, the, more, the closer you marry to um, somebody from your own family, the more <coughs> danger there is of producing real genetic defects. Uh, well, that is a process of time. And so, um, <coughs> These marriages that we are encountering with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, <clears throat> they are actually outlawed by the law of Moses, but they are not a problem at this time. Verse 5, So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Haran, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Haran, to take himself a wife from there, and that he blessed him and gave him charge, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Cain. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. Also Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and took uh, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajah, to be his wife in addition to the wives he had. Uh, Butler's the scholar I was reading this afternoon. Uh, you know what his theory is? What, what do you think Esau's up to here? No, I said, what's he up to? What's his motivation here? What's that? Uh, actually, I think uh, Butler's probably on to something there. He ain't given up on his blessing. He's probably like what you said, uh, Michelle. He thinks he can re reverse it. He's probably still angling for his blessing. Well, okay, you don't like the daughters of Canaan, huh? What do you think if I marry the daughter of Abraham himself? How about that? Would that be impressive? But anyways, it's a little too, little too little too late, as they say. Sometimes you may <clears throat> come to your senses. Well, we all will. What does uh, Paul say in Philippians? Uh, at the, knee of, uh, at uh, the name of Christ, every knee will um, bow, every tongue will confess. Um, be a whole lot of faithful people on the other side, but it's a little too late by then. Well, I shouldn't say faithful people, but people who understand what's on the line finally. <clears throat> uh, but anyways, um, that's as good a theory as any as far as what Esau is up to, but still, uh, the blessing has been given to Jacob and that's just the way it is. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth. And its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west 
to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Same language to Abraham in chapter 12, same language to Isaac, and here's the same language to Jacob. What does that phrase mean? In your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. It's a reference to the coming of Christ. He'll come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is in him that all the families of the earth will be blessed. So that promise is repeated to all three patriarchs. And of course, considering that in messianic terms, what does it mean? You shall spread abroad to the west, the east, the north, and the south. Where's the headquarters of the Church of Christ? In heaven. There are no worldly headquarters. Individual autonomous congregations in every nation on the face of the earth. Whoever turns towards God in faith, repents and in, in faith, repents and is baptized, shall be added to the Lord's church. And then evangelize the community that you live in. <clears throat> Get a few Christians together. You got a church everywhere you go. And, you, and not just the United States, but the world over. It's one of the reasons why I have to be careful when it comes to politics. Um, churches on every, in every country on the face of the earth that are supposed to be subject to Romans 13. What does Romans 13 tell us? Be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. So it doesn't matter where you're at on planet earth. You become a Christian. What's the government I'm under? It's supposed to be submissive to it. It's supposed to as much as is humanly possible uh, to live under that system. The only thing that makes the United States a little bit different is where does our government and our rights come from? Well, our rights, I should say, come from God. But where's our government come from? Of uh, for and by the people. That's us. Well, as citizens of the United States, to be a good citizen means in some sense to be informed. Cast an ignorant vote, that's not right. You're supposed to cast an informed vote. And so there's a delicate balance when you're a Christian as far as uh, I'm a part of the government in the sense that I need to be informed of issues, but by the same token, I am a Christian first and foremost, which means I need to be subject to my government. Um, but anyways. Unless your government is in conflict with God. Right, and that's what I mean. Is Yeah, we could talk about that all day long, Betty. Um, yeah, obviously when the government is doing something immoral, uh, there are times that we... Um, may have to oppose our own government. But anyways, back to uh, Genesis 8, 28, 14. Your descendant shall be as dust of the earth. That means uh, not only will the Jews, physical Jews, be scattered all over the world, but so will spiritual descendants. Spread abroad to the west, east, north, and south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you. And will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you. Until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep. And said surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid. And he was afraid. And he said how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose early in the morning and took, some, uh, took the stone that he had put at, the, at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the city had been Luz previously. And Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And the stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. One of the great stories from the life of Jacob. Um, first of all, anybody ever seen archaeologically this place here that we're talking about? It isn't the most scenic place. What do you think is going on in Jacob's mind before he has this dream? 
Imagine he's a little depressed. I mean, I think he knows getting a wife from his own people is the right thing to do, but still he's on the road. What's one of the reasons he's on the road? Yeah, my brother wants to kill him. So he leaves. Um, he's about, I think what I read today, he's about 48 miles into his journey when he comes to Luz and it's too late. Uh, so he sleeps outdoors, puts up this uh, stone for the, at the head of his bed. Uh, but anyways, imagine he's a little bit depressed. Isn't it amazing that God shows up to him right here? And he sees this incredible vision. What do you suppose the angels ascending and descending on the ladder represent? Well, one commentator that I read says the ladder represents Christ. That it is the link between man, or earth, and heaven. And the communication between earth and heaven is only through Christ or by Christ. does the same thing, but he adds, I was actually asking about the angels. Uh, angels carry our needs up to God. The vision, and by the way, I'm not sure what vision you get. I just get the vision of a ladder that you could use on both sides. Angels ascending up one side and descending down the other side. Angels taking man's concerns up to heaven with them. And angels ministering God's blessings to us down the other side. We know how often the Bible mentions that angels are ministering spirits uh, intimately interested in our salvation. Even the angels look into it, Peter said. Um, but they certainly are ministering spirits for us. Um, messengers, you know, how many angels do you run into in the Bible? Um, uh, doing uh, various and sundry assignments uh, for the benefit of man. <clears throat> but anyways, yeah, I think that's what it represents is um, the ladder represents Christ being the way. He, of course, is at the top of the ladder and the angels ascend and descend. Um, <clears throat> and verse 12, Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, God of your father, God of Isaac, the land which you lie, I will give you and your descendants. Now remember, Abraham had one son. Uh, Isaac has one son. How many sons is Jacob about to have? And I'm talking about from a physical standpoint. I mean, obviously Abraham had actually seven in total, or eight, I should say. Point, point being is, notice that when God said your descendants could be as the sand of the sea, it isn't apparent in the life of Abraham. It isn't apparent in the life of Isaac. But in the life of Jacob, boom, here's 12 sons. And they get married, and you can start doing the math real quick. Man. It doesn't take very long. Anybody remember at the end of uh, Genesis, how many, how many Jews are there on the face of the earth at the end of the book of Genesis? How many Jews are there when you turn that one page to Exodus? Two and a half to three million. So from the life of Jacob, you've got 70 Israelites. They go down into Egypt to dwell in Goshen while there's a famine. You turn the, that's Genesis 50. You turn to Exodus 1, and they immediately introduce a plan to kill all the male children because there's too many Jews. They're going to rise up against us. Well, there turns out to be two and a half to three million Jews is how many Jews are there. And how do we know that? Because the book of Numbers tells us that there were 600,000 fighting men in the wilderness. 
well, those fighting men had wives and children. And you do a little bit of math, you can get at a reasonable number without being exact. But anyways, um, your descendants will be as the dust of the earth. Verse 15, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you uh, until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Now what does it mean, the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it? I think what it means is, you ever have moments where you feel like God is a million miles away, or you feel like you're going through a spiritual wasteland? If I asked you point blank, what, have you lost your faith? You would be offended at the question. Because you'd know I should have more sympathy than that because we all understand. It doesn't mean you've lost your faith. It just means that you're going through a dry period and it's, life is a little more difficult than it normally is. And I think that's what Jacob is saying. He's been, his brother wants to kill him. He's all on his own, alone, contemplating the future. And he's not married yet. And... Here God says, I'm going to be with you. And Jacob, I think, recognizes what we all recognize is, is there any time that God is not near? He doesn't always feel near, but he's always near. For those who grope after him, as Paul said in the book of Acts. Then uh, verse 17, he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone that he put on his head, set it up a pillar, as a pillar, poured oil on top of it. Why pour oil on it? What did oil tend to represent? The Holy Spirit. Yeah. Prophet, priest, and king are anointed. The, the idea of anointing with oil does predate the law of Moses. But prophet, priest, and king are anointed. But here we see Jacob anointing the stone. And by the way, something else I thought about this afternoon, I've never used it as an example. Jesus Christ is the stone which the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. How far back does the image of the stone go? Right here. And you could even take it back to Abraham, but point being, the stone has always been an image of Christ. So he pours oil on the stone. Reminds me of the Holy Spirit coming on Christ in the form of a dove. And he called the name of that place Bethel. What does Bethel mean? It means house of, house of God. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, and by the way, I hate the word if in this verse because it almost sounds like Jacob is making God a deal. You do all these things for me and I'll give you my... my uh, Allegiance. That's not the Hebrew. What it, the Hebrew is actually saying is, if God is going to do all this for me, then I will certainly serve him all my days. But he's not striking some kind of a deal with God in that language, even though it comes across as though he is. Um, and of course, uh, Bethel, it means house of God. <clears throat> Verse 22, and the stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. That's the second time in the Bible the tenth has been associated with what we give back to God. Abraham gave a tenth to who? To Melchizedek. And here we see uh, Jacob long before the law of Moses, which gave a tenth to the ministry so that the Levites could be supported for the service of God for the other 12 tribes. Um, but anyways, uh, if we had more time, we'd talk a little bit more about this. But you guys, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one that has noticed there are a ton of people in this world who call themselves Christians that think a tenth and tithing is still very much what God commands of us. Uh, they have not moved on to the New Testament concept of giving. One last thing, and we're going over a little bit, and we'll call it night. Bethel. What else is that famous for? What else is Bethel, house of God, famous for? What, what else happens in Jewish history in Bethel? Let me ask it that way. When the kingdom split after the death of, Jer of uh, Solomon, Rehoboam got the two tribes of the, northern, of the southern kingdom, 
Jeroboam got the uh, ten tribes of the northern kingdom. What's the first thing he does? It's a golden calf in Bethel. Which is bad enough all on its own, but now that you've read the story, and I'm sure most of you already knew the story, but you may not have remembered that Jacob immediately changed the name from Luz to Bethel which means house of God. That's how sacred a place in Jewish history that should have been. And what does Jeroboam come along and do? Comes along and perverts such a sacred place. It's kind of hard to believe. But that's how a religious man can be. Um, Anyways, good chapter. We'll uh, pick it up next week. Charles, uh, feel free to uh, take the class at chapter 29. Charles will fill in for me. I'll be back in two weeks. Um, anything else we need to talk about? Um, fellowship meal this Sunday. Fellowship meal is on this Sunday unless the Lord comes back. We're having a fellowship meal. Is that the first? No. First, Sunday? Uh, the first Sunday? First Sunday. Apologies to all those out in computer land. I never know what the dates are, so thank you, Eddie, for correcting me. Not this Sunday, but two weeks. Yeah, I don't know why. I, I knew that, I didn't forgot I knew it. This Sunday is July the 31st, so last day of the month, and there is no fellowship mail this Sunday. It'll be a week from Sunday. Anyways, thank you all for tuning in and for coming out. Let's have a quick prayer and we'll go home. Lord God in heaven, we are grateful for this hour that we could spend learning uh, these stories all over again, Father, and remembering them and letting them bless us, Father. And we know that uh, even when we're going through difficult periods, Father, you are always with us. And we pray that as we meditate on this story, we will apply this to our own lives, knowing, Father, that uh, that you are uh, ever ready to uh, to uh, be with us, Father. And by faith, we know that you are there no matter what we're going through. Be with those of this congregation, Father, who are going through difficult times, particularly emotionally and spiritually. Bless them uh, in a ways that allow them to uh, recommit their lives to you. Bless those with physical healing uh, ailments, Father. Heal them uh, if it be your will, uh, and let much spiritual fruit come out of these difficult days. Bless us as we go through the rest of this week, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you all for coming out.